Walt, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. It was great to see you again last night. Thanks, I think it's, um, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I meant to say that you know, the, other, the first time I met you was actually you let me tag along when you went to Chez Penny's. And then, <laughs> then you let me tag along when you went to Mary Max Tea House in Atlanta during those. So that was Two that. very good places. And, uh, yeah. I mean, that was the first and only time I've been to Chez Penny's, so it was f- phenomenal. You know, you, uh, you like uh, Harvey and Rich, have been instrumental in, in really the field of echo in its early years. How did you, uh, how did you first become interested in echo, or, or, and when was that? The first time I saw an echocardiogram, I was at Stanford as a medical student, and I had uh, just written a computer program to uh, be able to quantify pressure data coming out of a cardiac cath lab. And I had access to a a very state-of-the-art IBM computer that uh, Joshua Letterberg had gotten from the Macy Foundation. So one day, Don Harrison called me in and said, there's a fellow coming, uh, coming here is, uh, who's been in Indiana with a fellow named Feigenbaum, and he said, he has a, an interesting image, and I want to see if you can digitize that. So they showed me a Polaroid film of what looked like a sine wave, and uh, I, I still have no idea what, what that was. At. I mean, I, Rich, I think, has an idea, but I didn't. <laughs> and I told him that I couldn't quantify it. And that was the end of that. So then I went for an interview at the NIH, uh, and Steve Epstein asked me uh, what I, if I had seen anything interesting recently. And I said, yeah, I saw this ultrasound uh, recording coming from a heart. He said, ah, oh, I said, you're chasing ghosts. He said, come back here and we'll do some real research. So by the time I got back after my internship and residency, echocardiography had really started evolving. And... Uh, I, I was told that there were a group of engineers in the basement, and if you had a crazy idea, all you had to do was go down there, and they would help you. So I went downstairs, and uh, this was at the NIH. At the NIH, okay. and I told them I had an idea. I was going to Indianapolis to see an echocardiographic machine, and, and I was thinking it might be nice if I had an engineer go along. And so the guy that I went to see said, well, he was busy, but he had a new guy who was just new, and why didn't I talk to him? And his name was Jim Griffith. Okay. And so Jim and I went to Indiana. Uh, Sonia Chang uh, showed us the ropes. Uh, and at the time, Harvey had the only strip chart recorder on an old E4M. Okay. And it was considered black magic. There was a black box. Nobody knew what it was. And Jim looked at that and said, it's just a video amplifier. It's no big deal. <laughs> and he also looked at the strip chart recordings, right. and he said that this E4M really had a very uh, big uh, image size, and that there was a new uh, device that had just been uh, declassified from the military, was used for side scanning radar, and it used fiber optics to uh, uh, record images onto a piece of paper. And he said, I think we should get one of those, and I'll get a video amplifier, and we'll go back to, uh, the, NI- to the NIH, and I'll make you an echo machine. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, the quality of the images f- using that strip chart recorder was just remarkably better. You could see individual reflections. Right. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how I first got interested in echocardiography. Wait, you, when, Walt, when, when was this approximately? I mean, there don't have to be exact well, dates. Are we talking? I, uh, I was at the NIH from 1971 on. Okay. And I first met Rich at Stanford probably in 1966, I would okay. say, 65, 66, okay. something like that. So, this, so this, we're really in the, in the late 60s, mid-70s. And, yes, and that's, that's correct. And, you know, when you, so did you get a machine? So if Jim built, built you this machine, how, what were, were you using it clinically or in research? What were you doing? Uh, we were starting to use it clinically, and uh, uh, we, you know, it was kind of self-taught, although we had learned a lot from Harvey and right. Sonia Chang. Um, and what struck me was that it, this was a device that for the first time allowed you to really obtain quantitative measurements of the heart. Uh, Prior to that, when I was in medical school, you know, we uh, looked at the temperature of somebody's toes or uh, we had this crazy <laughs> circ time thing. You injected something and waited until somebody, uh, <laughs> and, and it was, and it was nonsense. It was uh, phonocardiograms. People were measuring all kind of crazy intervals there trying to understand what was going on. Right. And all of a sudden, you could look inside the body. You could see the thickness of the walls. You could watch the heart move. You could see valves open and close. And I think my engineering background sort of triggered me to understand that it was possible to quantify things 
in a way that had never been possible before. What did you What did you first look at? So I mean, so if quantifying, I mean, and for people that might be watching this and they don't know although we'll hopefully can put some images in. What, what did the images look like? So what did the images look like and what did you first go after? Uh, well, uh, I went after, you sort of go where the money is at the NIH and that was hypertrophic okay. cardiomyopathy. And there was an incredible population of people and actually Steve Epstein was cleaning them out of his clinic. He said that they learned everything they could learn <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because catheterization data had been well worked out. Right. And uh, I said, you know, Steve, I'd like to, I'd like to study these people. I met Bill Roberts, who mm -hmm. was the pathologist at the NIH, mm -hmm. and he made the comment that the thing that characterized hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the fact that the ventricular septum was uh, much thicker than the free right. wall. And in every other condition, the left ventricular free wall and septum were the same thickness. So we began studying these people and realized that that was a marker for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And Chet Clark, who I uh, became very close friends with at the NIH, did a study of families who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we found a number of people who were asymptomatic in those families who had a disproportionately thick septum. So that was probably the first uh, impact of quantification, at least in the things that I did. Uh, and also we realized that there was a way to quantify the uh, amount of left ventricular outflow obstruction by looking at the mitral valve and how long it was in contact with the septum and how far forward it moved. And, in fact, the first paper I presented on echocardiography was showing the disproportionate thickening of the septum and showing the motion of the mitral valve, or the, uh, the mitral valve and how you could estimate outflow obstruction. It's, it's interesting to me because I remember in you know, my early days with echo at Stanford, again with Rich, is that you know, that was, there were lots of people you know, intrigued with that. The whole, mm -hmm. the whole mechanism was, you know, was Sam the obstruction? We you know how long was the obstruction and all that sort of stuff. So that's, so that's really... Uh, well, there was an engineer, uh, not an engineer, there was a, a, a cardiologist who uh, used to call the uh, NIH the Pooks Hill Mafia, mafia <laughs> and uh, potentates on the Potomac. And he believed that the obstruction was not present. It was a catheter entrapment issue. Right, right. And as soon as people saw these echocardiograms, the argument it was catheter entrapment just went right out the window. And it was very clear what was going on. After that, after that so, so I mean, that was obviously, um, you got intrigued by the, the ability to visualize and quantitate. Where, where did you go with ECHO and what else did you look at, um, well, you know, your personal history and your professional history with them? Um, we realized that uh, we used to scan the heart from the tip of the ventricle up through the left ventricular outflow tract. And you did that slowly as you were recording, mm -hmm. recording mm -hmm. strip charts. Mm -hmm. um, at one point I s said to Jim Griffiths, why don't we wiggle this thing or why don't we <laughs> do something that can develop a two-dimensional picture? And my first idea was to actually put three or four transducers on a ring and spin it. Okay. And uh, Jim said, well, you have to have a, a very high voltage going across the gap, and uh, I don't think we have devices that would allow that to happen. So he said, why don't we wiggle it? And so uh, he went down in the basement and came back <laughs> one day with a device, and uh, we started doing studies, and it was nonsense. Uh, every once in a while, we'd see something that looked real, and then other times, it was garbage. And uh, again, Steve Epstein said, ah, you're wasting yeah. your time. Wait till somebody else builds it, and you know, we'll buy one. I said, okay. So anyway, I went back to Jim, and Jim said, you know, the problem is that when you load the transducer, put it on the chest, and it's moving, the motor slows down, and yet the image going back and forth across the screen is at a constant speed. And he said, we have to put a feedback mechanism. So if you slow down the wiggling of the device, it'll slow down on the screen. So he put a little uh, potentiometer in there that allowed him to uh, draw the image on the screen properly. And we put it in a water bath and put a, a circle, a, a, like a ring in there. Right. And before, the ring would come together and go back apart as things <laughs> sped up and slowed down. Now it was perfectly clear, single ring. And uh, we started doing imaging with that, and all of a sudden it was, you know, we were seeing moving pictures of the heart. Yeah. yeah. What, and, and did you, what, what did you look at with that technology? So this is really early, this is basic early 2D. Uh, two things. Um, I, I realized that it might be possible to look at the mitral valve in cross-section, and instead of using these crazy 
calculations from the cath lab that it might be able to actually see the orifice. And uh, I did a study in which we looked at uh, various uh, methods of using the catheterization lab to quantify stenosis and realized that we could in fact see the orifice and measure the cross-sectional area directly. And then the other thing that was clear to me is that in complex congenital heart disease, it would be possible to sort through the great artery relations, whether there was one ventricle or two, whether the aorta was overriding the ventricular septum. Right. So I spent a lot of time trying to get access to pediatric cases with known diagnoses because as a non-pediatric cardiologist, it was not easy to do that. Right. But uh, Barry Marin, who was a pediatric mm -hmm. cardiologist at the NIH, helped a lot. Uh, David Son and I became close friends. Uh, we actually uh, uh, put the echo machine inside of a car, in, inside of a crate and had it shipped to Tucson. And we put it in the back of a, of a van and started off to Las Vegas where they had a clinic. And I'm sure David's told this story, but we got about 20 miles outside of Tucson when the police stopped us because <laughs> the van was low in the back and we had a guy with beard and long hair driving the truck. And uh, they opened the said, what's in the car? And he said, oh, it's ultrasound equipment. So and, sure. Yeah, sure. Right. right. So they opened up the back, and here was this crazy machine. They took the back off the machine. They were looking for the drugs. <laughs> or, or Roswell, New Mexico. Yeah. They thought you all had landed. <laughs> so we went on to Vegas, and we did a number of studies, and a lot of studies that David set up in Tucson. And then at one point, I actually went to uh, Hopkins and met Helen Talsic and right. spent uh, couple hours echoing her patients. Uh, she was semi-retired, but right. came back just to see that. It was, so it was, uh, th so those were the two things that I, I think I focused on. And I, if I could uh, yeah. just expand that, um, I, I presented uh, some, of this, some of these images at the NIH surgical conference. And Glenn Morrow said, you need to see Leon Schlossberg. And I said, who the hell's Leon Schlossberg? And he said, well, he started the first medical illustration program in the country under Alfred Blaylock, and he said, go down to my office and we'll give you his phone number. So I called him, and, uh, and he said, you know, I'm pretty busy. And, and then I mentioned Glenn Morrow had asked me to call him, and he said, well, maybe I could right. help you out. So he came over, and he, went, he and I went to a lab, the Mannion Cardiovascular Lab at the Armed Forces Institute of, Th of Pathology. Mm -hmm. There were about 8,000 little hearts in bags uh, labeled, mm -hmm. and uh, we took some of those out, and uh, Leon made pen and ink drawings showing what the relations would look like in cross-section because there was no other technique right. at that point that allowed cross-sectional imaging of the heart, and uh, my early papers in that work were illustrated by Leon Schlossberg, who was a, a cool. real giant in the medical illustration cool. field. Yeah. Uh, well, when do you, uh, i ask you two other questions. One is, how did you you, know, you were the third president of the American Society of Echo. How did you get active in the then fledgling American Society of Echo? How could you not? I mean, there was Harvey and Rich, and everybody was uh, was uh, convinced that this was something that was worthwhile doing. And if for no other reason, it was related to Harvey's uh, sparring with the radiologists who believed that uh, ultrasound was an imaging technology and and it should be under radiology and not under cardiology. And uh, uh, Harvey believed that it required people with a knowledge of physiology, a cardiac physiology and anatomy uh, to really use the technique appropriately. And, uh, and Harvey was right. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I think as I would view it, the American Society of Echocardiography was set up to sort of formalize that in some way or another. As you, you know, we, we both had the chance uh, recently to, to uh, sit with um, now the numerous past presidents of the American Society of Echo and reflect upon it. As you look back, you know, your time and now looking at where it is, it's, it's pretty wild to think about where it's come and everything that's developed in it. Yeah, it was, um, it, it real, uh, it's hard to, to overemphasize this point, it, and that is that it, for the first time, allowed one to look at the heart in real time and see what was going on. And that was a, a tremendous uh, breakthrough. And uh, not only that, but um, even the angiographic imaging techniques being a shadow technique really mm -hmm. didn't allow one to look inside the heart. You, go, you saw uh, sort of a shadowgram of something. Mm -hmm. So this was a 
completely new thing and a breakthrough. And I used to like to tell people, you know, we'd have an echo meeting and they could have it any place in the world or they could put it in the worst section of New York and there would be five or 600 people would show up because right. people knew instinctively when cardiologists saw this, that this was really a breakthrough and that they needed to, uh, to understand this. It, the, the, the other thing that I think is really unique and I think probably the society uh, I obviously wasn't there in the early days, like you and Rich and Harvey were, but the society was, was based um, not only abound around a fascination and love of this technique, but deep personal relationships. Yes. And I think that's some, something unique, and that's sort of, I'd like your reflection on that. Well, uh, I, I said last night that uh, my closest personal friends are the people that were in that room. Uh, we weren't in the same zip code, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but we saw each other every weekend, usually at some course or another. Yeah. And um, Phyllis Feigenbaum said, do you remember the time we walked uh, the streets of Rome? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Um, so uh, we, we became close friends as a result of a uh, commitment. And it was a commitment. It was, this was not just something people were doing for fun. This was a commitment right, to right. a technology that we all believed in. Right. And, uh, and I think those friendships that were uh, developed back then really allowed the uh, technology to advance as it did. I mean, we all had our own competitive instincts. Sure. But uh, we, we seemed to get past that. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a tremendous amount of fun. And I always had a sense that I was doing something worthwhile with ultrasound. Good. Well, I appreciate you coming and visiting with us. Great to see everybody. Hi. Loves seeing you. So it's great. great Thank to you, be Randy. Here.